Okay, I just made a chai and I'm gonna sit down and talk you through my extremely tentative TBR for 2023. Hello, okay, so when I say extremely tentative TBR, I mean extremely. So I never have a to be read list, a TBR because I do not like being told what to do, even if it's my past self telling me what to do. I really struggle with um, like TBRs because I'm such a mood reader and I will only read something if my brain is telling me to pick it up like in the moment. And I always have to kind of say to people when they gift me books, like, please don't be offended if I don't read it anytime soon. I absolutely love the book, it's just not time yet. Um, I've had to say this to my flatmate, my sister, and my boyfriend repeatedly because they know me so well and buy me books that are gorgeous, but sometimes it can take me a long time to get to them, not because I don't want to read them, but because my brain is like, it's not time for that book yet. So having said that, this list, thankfully, covers the entire year. So hopefully my brain will be able to say it's the time for that book. And if not, I hope to be able to exercise the level of self-control it takes to just like say, I'm going to read that book and then read it. So I'll just get it up on my computer. Um, okay, I need my glasses for this. <laughs> That's better. Okay in no particular order at all. Um, the first book I have there is Mothers, Fathers and Others by Siri Hustvedt. This is an essay collection and I love a good essay collection. It's about, to the best of my knowledge, about the boundaries within families, the family love and the family hate that we all experience and the power of art and relationships. I don't know that much about it, but it just sounded right up my street, so it went straight onto the list. <laughs> Next is The Wall by Marlon Haushofer, which I've seen a lot of people reading lately whose taste I greatly admire because I share it. Um, I think this might have been Julie's top book of last year, which made it an easy sell for me. I think it's about a middle-aged woman who wakes up to realize that she's the last human being left on earth. And I think it's a story of isolation and survival. It sounds a little bit sci-fi like, which is maybe out of my usual realm of reading, but I'm so open to it. Then I have The Stillest Day, simply because Ben Green said so. Next is Pure Colour by Sheila Hetty, which I'm surprised I haven't read yet because I read Motherhood last year and it blew my mind. I really love Hetty's writing and from what I know, this book is like a philosophical um, meditation on grief, which is meant to be quite out there. I have seen quite a lot of people saying that at first it was too out there for them and it was kind of going over their head and they didn't really enjoy the vibe or they couldn't get on board with it but having had time away from the book it hasn't really left their mind and it turns out that you know they actually did quite like it in the end um then i have sex in the cherry by jeanette winterson which was a christmas gift from my boyfriend i read written on the body by Winterson last year and absolutely loved it so much. Some of the best imagery I've ever come across in my life, just absolutely gorgeous visual writing. So I'm really excited to read Sex and the Cherry. Next, Modern Nature by Derek Jarman. So Mika, who I will tag downstairs, put this back in my mind. So towards the beginning, I think, of last year, I had read um, Funny Weather, Art in an Emergency, which is a collection of essays by Olivia Lang. We all know how much I love Olivia Lang. Um, and those essays are like profiles of artists and their most important work and their inspiration and kind of 
you know, them as human beings as well as artists. And the essay on Derek Jarman really stood out to me. And I was like, okay, look into Jarman's work. <laughs> and I guess Mika just put it back in my head to finally go do that. So I'm really looking forward to reading Modern Nature. Then I have Madness, Rack and Honey by Mary Ruffell, which is a collection of lectures on writing and poetry. And I love writers writing about writing, so it just sounds perfect to me. I love poets who uh, write about writing especially, so I think that that will be very enjoyable. I mean, I keep saying I think I'm gonna like that, I think it'll be enjoyable, but why would I put something on this list if I didn't think that I was going to enjoy it? Then I have Lucy by Jamaica Kincaid because all of the praise that it has been receiving has not gone unnoticed. Apparently Lucy is a very poignant story and Lucy as a narrator is apparently, and protagonist is apparently great. So I'm looking forward to jumping on the train of praise for Kincaid. Um, then On Freedom by Maggie Nelson because we need some big brain energy always. I love Maggie. On Freedom I think is broken up into four sections and I think it is art, drugs, sex and climate I think. Um, and just really about exploring freedom in different realms and even can freedom really be a thing like freedom really means constraint in other ways and i think that it's going to be very dense and very um referential and very intertextual but i'm very much looking forward to it um the seas by samantha hunt i think it's like small town vibes with a young girl who's convinced she's a mermaid she has a uh, an alcoholic father I think and it sounds very whimsical and surreal and almost a little bit folklore like so I think I'll get swept up into that quite easily. Then I have Emergency by Daisy Hildyard. This is one of the books that I've been bought as a gift by my boyfriend <laughs> um, last year like maybe near the start or the middle of the year and he knew I really wanted to read it and I did really want to read it but it's just been one of those books where for some reason the time just hasn't come for it to be read but now I'm declaring that the time will come soon. <laughs> um, I think it's about the the micro and the macro of life, urban and rural life and all the threads that hold it together. It's a woman who is in her flat during lockdown reflecting on her childhood in the 90s. I think in Yorkshire, somewhere in England, um, in the countryside. It sounds gorgeous. It, this was also on Julie's top books of 2022, but hilariously she put it in the non-fiction rather than the fiction because that's just how she read it and I love that for her. Then I have A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood, which is completely on this list because of Pato's endorsement. A man who has lost his partner and is trying to get on with everyday life. Um, apparently it's just, just incredibly moving, so I'm looking forward to that as well. I have to stop saying I'm looking forward to that because I know I'm looking forward to every single one of these books and you know that I'm looking forward to every single one of these books. Um, Death by Landscape by Elvia Wilk. Uh, that is an essay collection looking at, I think it's climate change through the lens of literature and mostly sci-fi, I think, and some other cultural references. Um, but yeah, I've only heard good things about that. It was one of the options that we had for my book club uh, a couple of months ago. It was either uh, Death by Landscape or The Last Supper, um, A Summer in Italy by Rachel Cusk. And the Cusk won, absolutely, but I wanted Death by Landscape, but I, I don't vote because I'm already picking the two titles, so I don't want to be too much of a dictator. So, you know, the people wanted Cusk, so the people got Cusk, and I did enjoy it. Then we have The Lonely City by Olivia Lang. I don't think there's any explanation as to why that's on my list. I simply love Lang. I've read most of their work, but I haven't read this, and I think it's Lang reflecting on their time alone in New York through the lens of art and artists as usual. 
I think maybe the first essay is about David von Jurovich, so I already know I'm going to love it. Um, Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. Um, so after reading O Caledonia in book club, we were discussing it and a couple of us had said that we don't usually uh, tend to pick up child narrators and that's true for me, like I don't tend to uh, want to read child protagonists. Um, I don't really know why, it's just not something I gravitate towards. But uh, Renee had read um, Housekeeping and said that if I enjoyed O Caledonia and specifically if I loved Janet, the protagonist, who I absolutely did with my entire heart, I love Janet, she said that I would get on really well with housekeeping and it's also meant to just have some absolutely stunning writing in it. So that's why that's up there. Following on from Child Protagonist, we then have My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferranti. I have wanted to read this for a long time. I've read quite a few of Ferranti's novels and I adore her writing, even though a lot of the time it makes me feel quite physically unwell because it is so intense and visceral and it really does something to me. Um, but I'd kept putting off the Neapolitan Quartet because I kind of wanted to read them all within the one year. So I know I just have my brilliant friend here, but ultimately I would like to read the entire quartet this year. But now that I've said it out loud, I feel like I've maybe jinxed that and it won't happen. Following that, I have Flights by Olga Tokarczuk. Her novel Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead is my favorite novel I have ever read. So I'm hoping, hoping and praying that um, the dizzying heights of my expectations for flights are not disappointed. So it's quite scary to go into reading that because um, I love Drive Your Plow so much. Um, in December, I read The Apprenticeship or The Book of Pleasures by Clarice Lispector and it cracked my heart wide open and just unraveled my mind and truly reading that level of like beauty in writing and just that level of self-reflection it did something to me it really did change me in a way so on my list here I have Agua Viva but I would happily read anything by Lies Spector then I have Blue Nights by Joan Didion which is I think her only non-fiction which I haven't read um, it is a reflection on Didion losing her daughter Quintana Roo, um, which I imagine will be very sad and moving, but if anybody can bring some sort of like searing clarity to devastation, then in my eyes, that's Joan Didion. Uh, the Door by Magda Sabo, because I've seen it floating around on booktube just now and a lot of high praise for it. I think it's about a writer and her housekeeper and their and their relationship over a number of years. Um, it sounds really interesting. Then Sula by Toni Morrison because to my absolute shame I have never read any Morrison because I she's one of those writers who I know I'm going to love, but for some reason that anticipation makes me put it off. And I think I'm also just overwhelmed by and intimidated by the breadth of her work. And I didn't know where to start, but Sula was suggested to me and I'm really, really excited to finally read some Toni Morrison. And then the last book I have on the list is The Art of the Novel by Milan Kundera. I read Immortality by Kundera last year and unexpectedly really enjoyed it. It was gifted to me by my gorgeous friend Niall and Niall really likes very uh, thinky philosophical works and for some reason he thought that I would really enjoy this book and I honestly didn't know what to expect but I ended up enjoying it a lot. So the art of the novel I think is Kundera's kind of conception of the European novel. I think it's got a lot of history in it, a lot about composition and yeah, his idea of what the novel has been, what it is now and where it's going.
on this list there are two books I think which will be buddy reads and I'm really excited about that because I've never done a buddy read before. I'm reading Pure Colour with Sweet Sweet Renee and I'm reading Sula with Nathan so I'm very much looking forward to all the bookish thoughts going back and forth between us and having some company whilst reading. Yeah, I feel like it's a good list. I, I would say that, it's my list. But um, yeah, I don't know how much I'm gonna struggle with having an actual physical list of things that I say I'm going to read because I do get sidetracked and just pick up whatever I feel like in the moment. But with such a big list, hopefully one of them will feel right for the moment at any moment. Um, I have actually started on the list and I started with the last book. I have been reading, oh, my feet have gone to sleep. Um, I've been reading The Art of the Novel by Milan Kundera. I'm about halfway through and it's a little bit boring. <laughs> um, it's very, very, very historical about European uh, fiction Russian literature and I don't know maybe it's just not where my head is at just now but I am lacking the level of engagement that I would like to have with it and I'm struggling with that because usually if I pick up a book it's because I'm really into the idea of reading it and I hope that doesn't mean that this list is off to a bad start but we'll see I guess. Also, a new thing has happened where I now read multiple books at once, but um, yeah, I used to have this like purity mindset where I would fully immerse myself in a book and it's like I wouldn't want the worlds of other books kind of tainting each other and I just wanted to have a full, pure experience that has absolutely gone out of the window because I'm also reading The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy at the moment. This book for some reason I've never picked up. It's a modern classic for a reason. It is a masterclass in narrative. The way that this book is structured is unbelievable. The, yeah, the level of detail, the, oh my God, the imagery is just, this book is incredible. And I feel like maybe I'm the last person in the world to read it and everyone's like, yeah, it's incredible. We all knew that. Um, but I am just absolutely in awe of Roy's writing. It is, oh my God, it's amazing. There is a lot of going back into the past and coming back into the present. Um, the past and the present are woven together through a lot of triggers in the form of words, in the form of objects, in the form of people. So it's kind of told through the eyes of um, a set of paternal twins, Rahel and Esther. Um, and it is about their family and the tragedy that befalls them. It is about trauma and coming back to a place of trauma almost to um, try and heal I guess I, I like I want to keep reading this so badly so when <laughs> I feel like whenever I've been reading this I really just want to be reading this um yeah if you haven't read it I would 100% urge you to if you like words then this book is definitely for you because the playfulness that Roy uses with the words here is it's exquisite yeah, I'm in love. I will definitely come back and speak to you more about this. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also listening to Women Talking by Miriam Taves on um, audio just now. And I think this might be the first audiobook that I have listened to that is being narrated um, not by a woman. So <laughs> that's quite interesting. But so far, I'm really enjoying it. It is. An incredibly heavy uh, topic that they're covering. It's about a Mennonite colony who have had a horrendous spate of traumatizing sexual attack and rape happening within their colony and yeah I've just started it so so far I am intrigued and definitely want to hear more. I think there's a film adaptation 
coming out this year, so it would be nice to follow up the book with the film. I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like my energy is like all over the place right now. <laughs> Speaking of films, I watched two films recently that are both new releases, but were both profoundly moving and absolutely gorgeous. Um, I watched After Sun, which is this beautiful, 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 heart achingly, heart breakingly stunning film made by Charlotte Wells, um, starring Paul Mezcal and Frankie Corio as father and daughter. And Frankie Corio plays Sophie and the story is told retroactively through older Sophie revisiting memories of her and her dad's time on holiday in the early 2000s in Turkey through uh, home videotapes and their performances are mesmerizing. It, it is beautiful. The authenticity of the earnestness of Sophie and her inquisitiveness and the way that you can tell how much she loves her dad um, and then Paul, Paul Mezcal's performance as a single father who's really struggling with depression is heartbreaking but incredibly well done. It is shot stunningly. It's a film for people who want a very... It's like a quiet story, like it's not highly dramatic and over the top. It's a very quiet, real, very human look at a close relationship and grief. Um, soundtrack is also great. And then I watched The Banshees of Inna Sharon, which is set in the little town of Inna Sharon. And it's a look at community life and the isolation that can happen within community. It's very darkly funny, but it's also very, very upsetting in a lot of ways when you look at how tense small communities can become and how complicated relationships can become. Um, Colin Farrell is perfect in this. His performance is, is so good and the best performance in my eyes comes from Jenny the Donkey. Definitely keep an eye out for sweet little Jenny. Um, I think that's everything that I've like been reading lately or currently reading. If you've read any of the books that I mentioned, please let me know your thoughts. If you have any books that you're like really excited to get to this year, then I'd also love to know them. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think I've kind of caught you up on everything at the moment. I love and appreciate you for being here. Mwah.